So, good morning and welcome to you wherever you are joining us from today. Um, we're glad you're able to join us in this way, whether you are in person here at the church or whether you are online with us on your tablet or your computer or even your telephone. We trust that you feel welcome and included regardless of what method you are joining us these days. Well, are you a keeper of rules, a bender of rules, or a breaker of rules? Or does it perhaps matter on the rule? Like, do you remove the do not remove tag on your mattress or your pillow? Do you wear your helmet when you ride your bike? Do you pay your taxes? When you are in the grocery store, how closely do you adhere to the limit of items for the express line? I confess to you, when I'm in the line and I have more than the number of items, but then there's nobody over there and the cashier says, just come over here, I feel very bad. <laughs> but I have 30 things. Oh, just come. But what if someone, oh my, it's all angsty. The grocery store has explicit rules like that, right? But, like, but there's also ones that you are encouraged to follow. Um, rather than being directed, like putting your cart in the corral in the parking lot. I don't think I've ever seen a sign that says you must put your cart there, but I have certainly heard many people complain when someone doesn't put their cart there. Rules and guidelines for living are everywhere we look. And right now, rules are a hot button for us. Some people want specific and official rules about where and when to don the mask, what activities we can do and we can't do because we want to know what's safe and what isn't and which things we're not supposed to do. And other people would much rather make their own decision based on their own interpretation of their own circumstances. We have a combination of formal and informal guidelines these days and people have very different comfort levels about how closely to stick to those guidelines. For some people, we are still in a very scary time when going out in public at all does not feel safe to do. And for others, the tolerance for risk is much greater and people are confident in their ability to manage the circumstances. And when you put those two groups of people together, it's very awkward. We don't always have a lot of tolerance or patience with those whose comfort level is not exactly the same as our comfort level. And part of what makes rules contentious is the question of who has the authority to make the rules or enforce the rules or interpret the rules. We have witnessed protests and civil unrest related to those questions at a variety of levels, from how law enforcement has been using or abusing their power, to who decides what can be open and what stays closed, to who decides how public health risk will be managed in schools or for elections. And now in the United States, with the death of Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, there is this opportunity to choose someone to fill a very powerful position in their country, which is all about interpreting and controlling their country's law. I think we would all agree that rules and regulations and guidelines are necessary. They're part of the agreements that we make as humans to live together on this planet in a society. They give us a sense of safety and security. But we also live in a time in the world when it is very unclear who has the authority to decide what rules really have to be followed. And we know from our own experience that while we know and we believe that we need to put parameters around behavior in community, we can also feel imprisoned or trapped by those same parameters. These things are hot. <laughs> And some of our rules benefit a few to the exclusion of others. And that's probably true of every loophole we can find. 
It all reminds me of Robert Frost's poem, Mending Wall, where he refers to someone who keeps insisting that good fences make good neighbors. Our rules are like fences defining our limits. However, as Frost says in his poem, before I built a wall or a law, I'd ask to know what I was walling in or walling out and to whom I was like to give offense. You see, those who make the rules don't always understand the impact of the rules on the people other than themselves, do they? And while some rules and guidelines make some people safer, they make other people less secure. So Jesus spent quite a bit of time bending and breaking the religious rules of his day for this very reason. It makes trying to figure out how to follow the rules a little more tricky. So what of the Ten Commandments then? Feel free to correct me, but I think that Bible rules are one of the things, or the kind of thing, that reduce people's interest in religion in general. <laughs> because people think of them as this list of rules that's impossible to keep, but people feel guilty about not keeping them. Or worse, we all probably know people who have had really bad experiences of being harshly judged or shamed or shunned for not keeping the Bible rules. Many people, I think, have experienced religious rules as a prison or a burden, limiting their ability to live their best lives. Well, Dr. Rolf Jacobson is a professor from Luther Seminary in uh, St. Paul, Minnesota. And he says that if we're going to find any meaning in the Ten Commandments for our own lives, there's two things that we need to remember about laws in the Bible. And the first is... That, Moses didn't, that God didn't give Moses these laws as a way for people to earn their way into heaven or even into God's good graces. These laws are not about making God happy. Although, I'm sure God is pleased when we figure out how to live well with each other. In the same way that laws and rules and guidelines in our society are about being in relationship with one another, these commandments... We're supposed to be a way to establish relationship. God doesn't make a claim on people's behavior until there is a relationship there. And we can see this right in the way they begin. I am your God. And if we're going to be in relationship, then respect my name. Be loyal to me. Now, this was a completely new idea for the people of Moses' time. This was a time when there were gods everywhere, official gods in many cultures all around them, who demanded all kinds of things and all kinds of behaviors and sacrifices. But nowhere was there a belief that any of those gods actually cared about the people. And so these commandments were not supposed to be fulfilled out of a fear of punishment. There's no contract. There is no threat in any of these laws that says, well, if you don't do this, I'm going to get you. These are like family expectations, not criminal code. So you don't follow God's commandments because you're afraid, I hope, but you do it because you care about your relationship. So the second thing that Dr. Jacobson wants us to notice about Moses' law is that they aren't about us. What? Wait, what? He says, God does not give you and me a law in order to perfect us or even make us a better you or a better me. It's not a self-improvement tool to help us live our best life. No, it turns out that these commandments are all about our neighbors. God tells the people to love their neighbors. And these commandments are an answer to the inevitable question, okay, but how are we supposed to do that? These laws were given so that your neighbor can have their best life now. And you can see that if you notice how many times neighbor is mentioned in the commandments. Over and over again, these are rules about how to treat other people. Honor your parents. 
Don't tell lies about your neighbor. Don't go after your neighbor's belongings. And on a day of rest, make sure that all of your neighbors, from your children right down to your servants and even your animals, get to rest just like you do. Well, no wonder when Jesus was asked which commandment was the most important, he summarized them all and said they were about love of God and love of neighbor. Turns out that was literally true. He wasn't making a new rule. He was explaining the ones they already had. So these commandments are good news for my neighbors. God loves them so much that God tells me not to kill them or steal from them or commit adultery and so on and so on. Well, you know that the selfish part of us is disappointed by that. Wait, I want them to be about me. Why would I go to all that trouble for my neighbors? This is where the burden of the rules starts to weigh a little heavily. Well, no, I don't want to have to wear my mask. It's all about my neighbor. We, don't, we notice the inconvenience. We notice the unfairness. The chorus about my rights, my freedoms, starts to rise. Ironically, these commandments were never about burdens. They were always about freedom. See, these commandments were offered to people who were trying to figure out what it meant to live free. After all they had known was slavery. You simply did what you were told for the benefit of someone who didn't care about you at all. And these commandments made it possible for people to view their new lives, even in the wilderness, not as chaotic, not as terrifying, but as meaningful and maybe even fruitful. So you are free, God says, not to have to bow down and need a whole bunch of other gods. You are free not to work yourselves into the ground. You are free from having to murder and steal and possess to establish yourself and keep you safe. In the land of freedom, the powerful can't just take what they want anymore. The strong don't dominate the weak because you are free to care for each other. You are free to care for the ones the world wants to forget. Rather than being a burden, these rules were supposed to lift burdens. What a shame if we turn them into something that only enslaves. Remember, Moses says, God loves your neighbors that much. And, turns out, God loves you so much that God asks all of these things of your neighbor, too. So, then what shall we make of these rules for ourselves? Can they have a place here and now in our contemporary lives? I wonder what might happen if we took a Ten Commandments approach to all of our rules, biblical, society, family, named, invisible, and viewed them through the freedom lens rather than the burden, rather than thou shalt not. Could we use them as guideposts to help us lift burdens for one another? And by extension, works for us too. So before we make or enforce or keep any rule, might we consider the effect it has on our neighbors? When our rules inconvenience us, before we protest too loudly, might we consider the impact on our neighbor? It might well help us as we navigate this very complicated world and this very complicated time, trying to sort out which rules we shall keep, which ones we shall bend, and which ones we need to break, so that together we can live our best lives together. May God guide us all on the way. Amen.